Let's get to the good stuff, the preaching of the word. We are in the book of Esther, and again, I got the idea. I was reading a little article by a guy named Max Licato. I don't agree with everything he writes, of course. But he had the interesting point that when we talk about fathers, usually we talk about Abraham. And uh, we'll talk about maybe Joseph, uh, Mary's husband, or there'll be some other David, perhaps, things we can learn from his life. But he made the point that Mordecai is actually an excellent figure, an excellent person to learn about fatherhood from. So I want to preach on fathers. So just as a, uh, as a precursor to the women here, I am preaching to the men today, but there is things that we could all learn from this. And I don't mean to in any way diminish your role or your worth in your work as a mother, but there is a unique emphasis today on fathers, but I trust will be something helpful to all of us. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Fathers, we come to thee now. We acknowledge, Father, you are our hope. Father, our, our sense of fulfillment and our sense of protection and our sense of provision is found in thee. And so, Lord, thank you for these trials that you bring into our life. Thank you for the things that you allow to draw us closer to you, that bring us to depend upon you, that cause us to leave our own strength and our own ability and find the ability which only you can give. And so, Father, we thank you for that, and we pray that you'd bless the service. Lord, please, we pray that, that you would help. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I want to look at a guy named Mordecai, and we're going to be looking at Persians this morning, because the book of Esther takes place in Persia. It is, how many of you have ever heard of the thing called Chaldeans? Have you ever heard of Chaldeans? Chaldeans is another name for Persia, Persians or Chaldea, Persia. Um, it is, these are the guys who took over after the Babylonians. Remember the Babylonians? They were the guys who came in and sacked Jerusalem, 586. And they level it, and then the Persians up them, and they uh, upstage them, excuse me, and then they become a world power. And Persia of the ancient world was amazing. Its realm stretched from Greece all the way over into what is modern-day Iran, all the way across down into Ethiopia. It was an absolutely massive empire. There was a guy named Darius, and Darius was the, was the guy who really brought this to being. This, but its height came when his son, Xerxes, came into power. Now, Xerxes is the Persian name. Ahasuerus is the Jewish name. So we're going to call him Ahasuerus. Maybe a little bit of Xerxes might get mixed in. But he is the guy that is really, really powerful. Also, the book of Esther, interestingly, is a, it's a unique picture of what the Jews were like after the 70 years of captivity, because not all of the Jews went back. The Persians were actually Zoroastrian, and they were actually quite friendly to the Jews. So you have Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel making three waves of return back into the Promised Land from this big group of Jews who have settled there, and many of whom eventually stayed there. So who are the main characters in this book? Well, the main character is a guy named Mordecai. He is probably the key player. And he is actually an important guy. He lives in the city of, in, uh, if you look on your map, it's called Susa. Um, it's, it's a Persian city. It's about, I guess, about 75 kilometers from the Iraq border. So it's east of there in the city of Persia. And this guy, Mordecai, lives in that place. He's Jewish. And he does something unique. He adopts his cousin and becomes a father to her. Her cousin's name, the Persian name for her, is Hades, Hadassah, excuse me, which is Persian for dazzling beauty. And her Jewish name is Esther. And that's what we know her by. So there is a law of the Medes and Persians. How many of you have ever heard of that? Law of the Medes and Persians. Unbreakable law, so it's thought that the emperor, Xerxes or Darius, is, is infallible, kind of like the Catholic ex-cathedra stuff, but so if he speaks, it's, it's the word, it's, it's unbreakable, and so even he cannot break it. So these things are kind of moving in the background. So what sets the situation off is a queen named Vashti. The first part of the Bible is about her, but she quickly um, fades away. 
So there's an amazing banquet that takes place. Now, how many of you have ever had a party for your kids, or maybe you had a special celebration, maybe it was in your wedding, and does not not sometimes in these special celebrations say a little something about us? You know, we're doing these things and it is the food is good, and the decorations are amazing, and it kind of makes a little bit of a statement about us. Well, in the ancient world, they did a lot of that, and so they would have this party, and this party would last for six months. And that is quite a statement of power. Six months. Well, not only was that not good enough, he then has a seven-day after party. And he gets this idea with him and his drunken friends, hey, let's call Vashti the queen and get her to come before us. Now, I don't want to be overly blunt here, but I don't think he was calling her to observe her intellect or her beauty. And I kind of think you would agree with me. So Vashti thinks about it. Well, they've been drunk for six months, and now they're really drunk on their last seven days of this feast, and it's a bunch of men in there. I'm not going in there. And none of us can blame her for not going in there. But she defied Xerxes, and all the men get in a, in a huff about it. And so Vashti is removed, and they send out these messengers throughout Persia, and particularly Sushan, the Susa, if you will, in the modern name, the palace area, trying to find beautiful women who could be the new queen. And this is where we find ourselves today. Now, the unique thing that we find here is that this Jew Mordecai is a unique individual, and he does something that is, as, as a story unfolds, we begin to see a character and an action that I think is a model for you and I as men. Let's look at them in chapter 2 and verse number 5 of Esther. Esther chapter 2 and verse number 5. Now in Shushan the palace was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away from Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. So the previous kingdom, the Babylonians, carried all, a lot of the Jews away. The land was depopulated, just like God said he would do that. They were judged, and they were kept in this place, in this like incubator in a foreign land. So they could kind of think about some things and meditate on what they should be without all of the distractions of the place that they previously had been in. So... We see in verse 7, he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she was neither, had neither father nor more mother. The maid was fair and beautiful. That means she is a stunner. She is absolutely beautiful. Who Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Now that is interesting. You see, he begins to do something here that is quite, quite fascinating. He begins to say, I will become a father to my much younger cousin who is now an orphan. So he chooses to become a father. It's a conscious choice that he makes. I will be a father. Now, this is an interesting principle because ultimately good fathers are ones that make the decision I'm going to be a good father. You know, he could have said, well, I'm not really up for this. Being a dad? I mean, what does it mean to be a dad? How do you be a dad? He could have said, oh, let's send her to Jerusalem. He could have said, let somebody else raise her. Let somebody else be a father to her. But he didn't. Now, ladies, this is so different for men because, ladies, when you carry that child, that child is part of you. And you begin to have an intimacy and a knowledge of that child in your stomach, in your womb. As you carry that baby for those nine months, you begin to know them. There's an intuitive insight or knowledge of the baby while you're carrying them. And when that baby is for, it comes out, yeah, you see him, but you already know him. That's your baby. You've carried that baby, and now you are following through 
on this baby and what that baby needs. Now compare that with a guy. When a guy meets a baby, he meets the baby and knows very, very little about the baby other than what the wife communicates. Maybe he puts his hand on the tummy and he feels the baby kick a little bit. But other than that, he's completely separated from the baby. And when the baby is born, he is confronted with the child that is in front of him, his child. But in that moment of confrontation, he, in a very different way than the mother, must make a choice to become a father. I remember when the triplets were born, Beth had carried them for a um, little less than seven months, and they were, they were very premature, and I remember seeing them in that neonative intensive care unit, and I remember being astonished like when a dad sees the baby for the first time, it's, it's a revelation. Whoa, I am a dad. This is my children. It's not so much a conception in those previous seven months. It's at that moment that he makes that choice. And my point is, men choose and good men choose not only to be the father, but to continue being the father to the children that they are the father of. So every man makes that decision. He's clear, he's decisive on that moment. And can I tell you that is one of the most important moments in the life of that family, in the life of that child, and in the life of the mother. The decision to not only be a male who is present, to not only be a male who provides, to not only be a male who protects, but to be a father to those children. I want to read you some statistics because I think it's important that in a world that has taken genders and erased so much of what makes a woman a mother and what makes a man a father, look at the consequences of this. 40% of single mothers live below the poverty line. It's five times higher than normal. When the dad is not in the home, a woman is five times more likely to be in poverty. 63% or two-thirds of child suicides occur in a home where there is not a father. 71% of teen pregnancies occur in a home where there is not a father. 71% of secondary school dropouts occur in a home where there is no father. It is said, the statistic I have is 85% of children with behavioral disorders come from a home where there is no father. 90% of children who run away or become homeless come from a home where there is no father. 90%. If a child grows up in a home where there is no father, they are 20 times more likely to be in prison than a child who has grown up in a home with a father. These are amazing statistics, and they have been proven over and over and over again. The presence of a male who is in the role of a father is absolutely essential. It is very important. Now listen, single mothers, we are for you. We are behind you, supporting you, and helping you. But we have to have an honest conversation. We have to recognize what it means to be a father and why a father is so important. Look with me in Matthew 4 and verse number 5. Now, this is the last verse of the Old Testament, the last few verses of the Old Testament. So if you see Matthew and roll back one or two pages, you'll come to Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So he's telling them, but there's going to be a, a, a messenger. And of course, this is John the Baptist. He is the spirit of Elijah, who Christ identifies as, as the spirit of Elijah being John the Baptist. As Christ is coming and presenting the kingdom, there is going to be a movement, a work of God, the presence of God, and the, 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 the kingdom and its fulfillment, its, its, its realization will occur when a certain spiritual condition is present. And that condition is noted in verse 6. 
He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their father, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And God is saying that when a father loves his children and he leads his children and he provides what only a father can give to his children, that family is helped and strengthened in a way that it can never be without him. Mothers have an amazing ability to, to nurture the whole person, their interaction emotionally, you know, through their communication skills, through their love, and through their support of that child is absolutely vital in the life of that child. But it needs a father. It needs a father to strengthen. It needs a father to give structure. It needs a father to give rebuke. If a child is watching a violent video game, an 11-year-old child. It is not enough to nurture. The child must be confronted and rebuked for what he is doing. The father must give that strength. The father must give that, that, that direction. It's, a, it's a vital to the outcome of the home and the outcome of the child. What makes Mordecai unique is that he comes into the life of this orphaned cousin much younger than him. And he begins not only to be a provider and a protector, he begins to become a father to her. And he begins to create within Esther a destiny that cannot be realized without his influence. And I'm just saying, into our world that has dismissed fathers, into our world that has denigrated fathers, it is very important that we are very strong in this way a lot of men feel defeated, and they don't feel appreciated, and they don't feel encouraged to step into that role as a father, and they spiral in an immaturity without responsibility. Ireland has historically been ruled by irresponsible fathers and the priest and the mother making core decisions in the home. Many in 2023 have rejected the unique role of a father. And when we look at our Bibles and we see men, we see men like Abraham, men like David, and we see how they work and how they react, how they work with children, how they treat each other. The way that they're operating is very different from our world. And something that I'll tell you a way that you can see this, because if Satan wants to destroy, if he wants to ruin a culture, what he's going to do is he's going to destroy the father. He's going to remove the dad. He's going to push him out. And at that moment, he will be able to enter and cause much more damage than he could, than he could any other way. Have you ever noticed when you watch TV or you watch a movie how the father is oftentimes an imbecile? Now, I'm not saying we can't. father is the naive one, the overbearing one who's causing more damage than good. And the role of a father has has been systematically undermined. Listen, there are things that fathers have not done, and there are so many people in the world that have had bad father figures. But let that not taint us from recognizing the importance of this and encouraging this and strengthening this in our church, in our homes, and in our relationship. It, 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 it just it has to be a part of them. Ephesians 6 speaks of fathers and how they're to be honored. And it says actually in verse number 2 of Ephesians 6, honor your father and your mother. So both fathers and mothers are to be honored. They are to be respected and acknowledged. In verse 4, he gives a unique warning to fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. In other words, do not incite your children, fathers, because of the authority, because of the strength that God has given you. Do not use that to be overbearing. Do not use that strength to cause your child to be crushed by that emotional strength and that, that, that force that is within you. Provoke them not to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition. Nurture is a sense of correcting words that we speak that guide. The admonition is rebuke. It is a sense of confronting. 
So don't be afraid to confront. Don't be afraid to be decisive. Don't be afraid to give structure and discipline. Don't be afraid of the big picture view that God gives men, and he does give them that, where they see the big picture and they, they see the dangers and they're able to corral their children and help them reach their potential and become what they should become. So fathers, we must be that in our homes. We must take responsibility, squarely face the challenges, not only providing a home that is safe, and secure, but providing a home that has what you can give it as a father, that strength and that wisdom that that home needs in cooperation with your wife. Now, it's interesting how Mordecai works here, because Mordecai is not really a lecturer. He lectures a bit. He'll, he'll guide verbally with his words, but he does quite a bit more than that. Mordecai leads that home through his own character and his own integrity. Look at verse number 20 of chapter 2. Esther had not yet showed her kindness nor her people as Mordecai had charged her. She is a queen now, for she did, command, she did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. So notice how the respect and the sense of relationship that is there with Esther. So high is her esteem of her father, of her dad. Though, the, though she be queen, she still holds him in a high regard. It's an interesting picture. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, he's an important guy, and the king's gate is where decisions are made. Court is held. So he, he's sitting in the king's gate. Two of the king's chamberlains, Bigtha and Teresh, they sound kind of bad. They don't sound like good guys of those which kept the door were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it on to Esther the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. Now, this is important. Mordecai shows integrity here. He shows character. He sees corruption. He sees people that are going to hurt the king. And he stands up for him. And he, he steps forward and he identifies these men and Esther certifies what he says, and it goes into an official register, an official chronicle. It's important. In verse 23, because later in this biblical story, it'll come out why this is important. When an inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the chronicles before the king. So we then begin to see this guy, Haman. Haman is another character in the book of Esther, he is a raging bigot, arrogant, with a massive ego bigger than the country of Ireland. He is, he is absolutely a, a egotist, a narcissist. And he gets going and he says, if I walk around, you have to acknowledge how great I am by bowing to me and giving reverence and worship to me. Mordecai says when Haman walks by, he's a powerful guy. Somehow he got to be number two in the country, and he's really pushing it. Mordecai sees him, and he says, I'm not bowing to this guy because I only bow to the king of kings and lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he will not bow to any man. He will only bow to the Lord. So Haman walks by, and he stands there. And Mordecai looks at him, and he goes, what are you doing? And everybody is bowed all around. Everybody is down on their face before the great Haman. And Mordecai just stands there like this. That's character. That's strength. That's a man who stands for his principle. That's what effective fathers are born out of. That is what they are made out of. You see, children catch character from good fathers. When a child catches what it means to be strong, when they begin to walk into this character that God wants them to have, they need to see that in their father. They need to see the father make the decisions that are costly. They need to see the father stand on principle because it is the right thing to stand on. When they see that, they begin to transmit and it begins to be communicated to the children. So we wonder, how does Esther receive the strength to do the things that she does? Because she does amazing things in correcting what would be genocide of the Jews. She reverses that. 
How did she get the courage to do that? Mordecai. His character. She grew up with that. She understood it. And it was her character. It was the way that she was made. See, a crisis does not develop character. You're not going to go into a crisis. I'm not going to go into a crisis and say, oh, I need to find character. Crisis reveals character. When we go into those trials and into those great, great conflicts of life, that's when our character is made known. That's where character is seen. So can we look at Esther and realize that she is a woman that is who she is because of the character and integrity of her own father? You see, character is not so much something that we're going to give to our children because we tell them to be right and to do right and to stand strong. Our children are going to be right and do right because they saw dad standing when it was hard. They saw dad sacrificing to be a man of character, to be a man of his word. Our world is so devoid of character. People say things, and they have no intention of doing them. We need to be people of, I just, just feel it's important that we as Christians are people of our word. If we say we're going to do something, we're going to do something. Character is revealed by how we respond to circumstances. It reveals what we're willing to do to keep our word, no matter how costly that is. It's revealed by what we do when no one is looking. It's revealed by how we respond to wickedness and do the right thing. My dad has a character that, that I admire. And my family was a family that was very corrupted by drink, alcoholism. My dad was an alcoholic. He was an alcoholic for decades. It was a chain that he carried with him. And my mom loved babies. And so in her love for babies, she had a lot of babies. She had 10 children. And she just loved babies. She loved children. And that was just her great joy in life, was to be a mother of children. But my dad is in this relationship with my mom. And he has this weight of a chain. Now, my dad is a pretty smart guy. He's, a, he's in management in this big print company. He's, he's making big money. But he's also weighted by, by alcoholism. So here he is. He's got a home of 10 children. And he's struggling as an alcoholic. And what do most men do in that moment? They walk away. They go nurse their wounds. They go take care of themselves. But my dad never did that. Now, if Christ had not come into our home, our family would have been a wreck. It's people always say that I would have been dead before 20. There was so much dis destruction in my life. So Christ came in, and we began to become saved. But in throughout that period, my dad began to exhibit this really strong character. He did the right thing. He was there in the home. He never left. He never abandoned. He never forsook. He did the right thing. He wasn't perfect. He was cranky. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was all of these things. About five years ago, my mom got Alzheimer's. And she began to struggle with Alzheimer's. Do you know what my dad did? He stuck to her like glue. He has taken care of her. He has been with her. He is inseparable from her. About three weeks ago, she went into the hospital. She took 40 liters of oxygen because she has a lung disease. In addition to the Alzheimer's, my dad never went home. He put a cot for him because he wouldn't leave. He won't leave my mom. And I got a text message this morning my brother and sister is trying to get my dad, she's in rehab now, trying to get her back on her feet, trying to have him come over for dinner. He won't leave her until she goes to sleep. And he's there every morning when she comes up. He's there seven days a week. It's character. And can I tell you, I have nine brothers and sisters, and there is no divorce in the family. No one has ever divorced. They're good men. They're not all saved. Six of the ten are saved. Three are not. But they're honest men. Hardworking men, fair men, kind men, 
good men, men who are good to their wives and good to their families, and wives who are good to their husbands and good to their families. It's character. That's what character is. That's what character does. And we need to be men and women of this character. So Mordecai, what's cool about him, what's neat about him is he embraces that role. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. Esther chapter 4, verse number 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come unto the kingdom for such a time as this? Listen, we love our kids, and we don't want our kids to face bad things. Andrew's in, in Galway, and man, I don't want him to, to be heard. I don't want him to face a rejection, but he's got to. If he's going to do something for God, he's got to put himself out there. He's got to declare the word. He's got to preach truth, regardless of what comes. And it would be easy for Mordecai to tell Esther, hey, Esther, just, just hunker down, be quiet, get out of the way, just let this thing pass over. But he doesn't. He says, Esther, rise up. Esther, you were born for this moment. This is you, Esther. This is you becoming what God created you. You're not here for it by accident. You are here because God put you here for such a time as this. Esther, go forward. Embrace the risk. Step through the danger and become the person that God wants you to become. That's what dads do. They have that strength that propels their children, that they'll reach their destiny, they'll reach their purpose in life. They challenge them to do that. Excuse me, I'm a little behind here. Look at chapter 5 and verse number 1. Now it came to pass that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. Now she is a shrewd and savvy woman. What do you think she looked like? She can't go into the king unless he, lit, he tilts his scepter to her. When he tilts the scepter or his, his golden rod, she has to touch the scepter and then she's accepted by the king. If he does not hold the scepter out to her, she's immediately beheaded. That's a lot of pressure <laughs> to come in before your husband. I mean, that's a lot, a lot to ask of anyone. So. What would you do, ladies? Well, she puts on a royal apparel. I think she got made up. I think she maximized her beauty. And I think she stood a way that only a woman can stand, right in front of Mordecai, caught his eye. Probably look, looked again. His eyes probably got big. Whoa, Hester, come on in. She comes in and she touches that scepter. And he says, Esther, what do you want? Anything, anything, up to half of the kingdom, take it. And she goes, look, I just, I just want to have dinner with you, you and me. And let's have this guy Haman with us too. He thinks it's a little strange. He preferred just having dinner. But remember, they do like to have parties. They do like to have these festivals. So he goes, yeah, OK, we'll, we'll bring Haman too. So he brings Haman in, and they have the little dinner. And he asks Esther, Esther, what is it? What is it that you want to tell me? And she says, why don't you come back tomorrow? And then a very unique thing happens in that moment. Haman goes home feeling really big. And when he walks home, again, Mordecai doesn't bow before him. And he says, I had this great day, but I can't even enjoy it because Mordecai. And his wife and his children say, look, he's a pain in your neck. Why don't you be a pain to his neck? Build gallows that you can hang him on. Great idea. He says, so through the night, he builds gallows that are 75 feet high to hang, hang, to hang Mordecai on. As he begins to think about how good he has it, he starts to go back to the kingdom. But during the night, the king is woken up. And he is just to go, in order to go to sleep, what do you do to go to sleep? Read something really boring. I do that. I'll read something really heavy, really boring. 
So he, he has the Chamberlain read the, the Chronicles, and he discovers what Mordecai did. And he says, what's been done for this guy? And they say nothing. And at that moment, Haman walks in. And he says, Haman, what should we do for somebody that needs to be honored, for somebody that needs to be respected, who has received no credit for what they have done? And Haman says, let him ride through on your stallion, wearing your crown and your robe, and let everybody bow before him and say, oh, what a great person they are. And then King Ahasuerus tells Mordecai, tells Haman, do this for Mordecai the one he hates. He then drags Mordecai through the city. For hours and hours and hours, he's his chauffeur. It is humiliating. When he gets home, he tells his wife, and she's like, whoa, this is not a good sign. The king's chamberlains are there. They immediately usher him in to the final party between Esther, Ahasuerus, and Haman. In that party, the king asks Esther one more time, Esther, what's wrong? Tell me what's bothering you. What is, what's wrong in this situation? And she says there is a wicked man, a vile man who wants to exterminate my people. The king's neck becomes stiff. He begins to step backward. Who is that? And she points that pretty finger at Haman and says, Haman is the man. And immediately, Haman falls down. And the king walks out because he's so frustrated. He comes back in, and he thinks he's trying to make a move on his wife. And he says, get rid of this wicked Haman. And they hang Haman on the very gallows that he had created for Mordecai. It's an amazing biblical story, a beautiful story about what God will do in the life of a man who is true to him. I won't go into it for the sake of time, but Mordecai therein becomes the right-hand man of the most powerful man in the world. He is given the signet of the king and the authority of the king, and through his wisdom, his organization, his skill, the nation is preserved, along with Esther. Them working together, a great thing is done. So what can we learn from this? Never, never underestimate the providence of God. If you have a Haman in your life right now, if I have a Haman in my life right now, a troublemaker, somebody that's a thorn in our flesh, remember the story is not over. The culprit may be on the throne, but the power of God has not been fully seen yet. When we look at history and we look at the lives of a believer, we see sovereignty. We see a great God with his power bringing perfect justice we see God unveiling himself in his judgment and in his mercy. So let us never underestimate providence because who would have thought that God would use them in that way and that God would preserve his people in the midst of this plot, but he did. Never underestimate also the influence of a good, godly father. We don't see oftentimes in the moment what our influence produces. But let that not discourage us. Let us remember that God is a rewarder. God rewards, and his reward is substantial. It is deep. It is influential. And in the moment, we may not get that. But let that not discourage us from seeking the reward, which is certain to come through a man who influences his children. We may never be called to speak to a queen who's in a throne room, but we may be called to speak to a teenager who is struggling. We may be called to give guidance to a young person, that, a young child that is developing friends that are leading them in the wrong way and exerting a wrong influence on them. We may be called to find face to face with our children, to stand firmly and sternly and give the direction that they need let us remember that influence echoes through the years. That influence lives on in our children. Let's be that influence. Let's be that father to them. And finally, never estimate the reward of being a good father. Look at Esther chapter 10 and verse number 1. And King Ahasuerus laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea and all the acts of his power and of his might and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai. 
whereunto the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. I just think that when a man is a father, that not only is his family changed, not only are his, are his children changed, he's changed. And I think through the selflessness, and I think through the taking of responsibility, and I think through the influence that he exerts, he becomes a man of great value, a man of substantial worth. And I think it's recognized. Good men who are good fathers are valuable men. Men that people know are men of worth and men worthy of being honored. So I pray that as we look at the story of Esther, men will be encouraged to not define ourselves by the home that we grew up in, not define ourselves by the ethos and attitudes of those around us and the world around us, but define ourselves by the way that God created us and the roles that God has given us. And as we embrace those roles and become godly fathers, we find a strength and influence, a reward that we'll never find in any other way. I pray that we, we would be a church that has good and godly fathers. Let's pray with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Are we willing to embrace a biblical truth that runs contrary Maybe the way that we feel, a way that we're leaning into our life. Can we embrace by faith the truth that God has given that when a man becomes a father, when he makes that choice, his family is incredibly strengthened, incredibly helped through that choice that he has made to be a father. May we ever encourage that as the people of God, and may we ever as men choose that, that we have the reward and the influence that a good father has. Pray, whatever the need, as the Lord leads, you allow him to work in your heart. Father, thank you for the truth that you have given. Lord, I pray for the men that are here that you would help them. For anyone that watches this, Lord, that you would help them, Lord, to be the men that you want them to be, that we would recognize the unique contributions of mothers and fathers to the home. God, strengthen us. Lord, help us to become what you want us to become, that we might reap the life that only you can give. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a couple of announcements here.